Welcome. Uh, my name is Gerald Millen. Uh, I am the director of the Rights Program and the professor here at the law school. Uh, and it is my immense privilege to be able to introduce to you Kenneth Roth, uh, a towering figure in the human rights world uh, who was the executive director of Human Rights Watch, one of the principal international NGOs uh, on human rights uh, in the world. Uh, for almost 30 years, uh, he has now stepped down from that role uh, and who is uh, now a fellow uh, at the Carr Center at the Kennedy School uh, and also a fellow at the Perry World House uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, using those uh, institutions, uh, at home for writing uh, a book about the strategies uh, by which Human Rights Watch uh, has defended human rights uh, in the world. Uh, I'm extremely glad uh, that he is with us at Harvard, uh, and I am very grateful to him for coming over from the Kennedy School uh, to the law school uh, to share his thoughts with us today on the global contest between democracy and autocracy. Uh, after we've spoken for a while, we'll turn to questions and answers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you very much. I um, appreciate your hosting this. I have to say it's a pleasure to be here on the free speech side of the Harvard campus. <laughs> <laughs> You know, th this was the side of the campus that put out a report on apartheid in Israel, while the other side of campus was vetoing my fellowship. So um, I, I recognize the difference. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy that in my personal situation, the decision was reversed. But, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the problem. And I've had so many people come up to me and say, you know, great that you're here, but we can't talk about Israel-Palestine from a pro-Palestinian perspective. We feel afraid to criticize Israel or, or various speakers we bring in, forums we want to hold are blocked. And so I, you know, there is a need to address the broader problem. And I'm actually going to see um, the provost right after this talk. Um, and I'm going to ask him, as I asked Dean Elmendorf at the Kennedy School, to issue not just the kind of blanket affirmation that they already made about academic freedom. It's easy to say that I'm for academic freedom. You know, but to say it explicitly in the context of Israel-Palestine. That you know, all views are welcome, all views are protected. And we'll see. Um, they should be able to do that. That should be a no-brainer. But you know, I fear that the same factors, the people who mattered to Dean Elmendorf, that stood behind his initial veto of my fellowship, you know, continue to exercise influence throughout Harvard. And frankly, it's not just Harvard, you know, we know it's, it's, much, it's a much broader problem. But if Harvard can't play a leadership role on this, who can? So, um, you know, I intend to continue to push this issue. Um, I'm gonna need your help because, you know, the, the Kennedy School Dean would not have reversed his decision if not for the massive outpouring of opposition from the Harvard community. And I hope that that kind of mobilization can continue to address the broader problem. So that's just um, my, my prelude. Um, now, what I wanted to talk about today is this global contest between autocracy and democracy. And you know, the common wisdom is democracy is in decline. Autocracy is ascendant. You know, we've, we've had the heyday of democracy. Now we're moving into a new era. And there, you know, as with everything, you know, every piece of common wisdom, <coughs> there's an element of truth to that. But I think overall it's wrong. And I want to explain today why I think that's wrong, but also I want to address the element of truth. Um, I say that it's wrong because if you look at sort of the the classic autocrat self-promotion. It goes something like this. Democracies are messy, 
they're divisive, they're slow, they're short-term oriented. You need a strong man, and it's always a man, you know. You need a strong man to, um, to act decisively, to address the world's problems, you know, to, to lead. And, you know, that's this, this self-promoted reputation. We have had two very visible examples of what goes wrong with that theory, um, just recently. Um, and if you think about it for a moment, you know, autocrats kind of by their nature surround themselves with sycophants. They discourage debate. They prohibit criticism. They operate in this vacuum where they look around and decide what the right thing is to do, often with very self-serving motives of staying in power or continuing the flow of, of corrupt funds. And then they decide. And we've seen what happens recently with that kind of circumscribed decision making that kind of debate-free decision-making. We had Putin, who was sitting in his COVID-enforced isolation, who was you know, reading his history books about you know, the Russian grandness of the past, and decided that there is no Ukraine, you know, that Ukraine is a fiction, and that he would launch this invasion, which would be a piece of cake anyway. And in a matter of days, he would be in Kyiv and getting rid of um, the neo-Nazis who were presiding there. And so, you know, that's what he convinced himself of. And there was zero debate. You know, there was no opportunity to influence him. In fact, I mean, you may remember this photograph of Putin, you know, at the end of the long table, because he was worried about COVID. And all the generals were the other end, and they were kind of cowering there, and they had to answer him, you know. And they didn't even know what the right answer was, but they knew that they had to give the right answer and not what was the truth. You know, and, and of course, that's how you make disastrous decisions. Um, Xi Jinping, very similar. You know, coming out of... The, the Chinese Communist Party big conference that, that you know, confirmed him for his third term and probably you know, made him an emperor for life. Uh, he you know, doubled down on zero COVID, utterly indifferent to the, the huge human and economic costs. And when suddenly he was facing the largest protests since the pro-democracy movement of Tiananmen Square, he panicked and went from zero COVID to zero preparation opening, you know, and just like lifted the barriers, but with no preparation, you know, no serious effort to vaccinate older people, still barring mRNA vaccines for nationalistic rather than public health reasons, you know, not investing in the intensive care units that are were obviously going to be required as, as hospitals got overrun. And so again, enormous cost to the people of China. And you can see, you know, comparable acts in his um, efforts to quash the most dynamic sectors of the, the Chinese economy because he saw them getting as too powerful and too much of a threat to, to his power. Um, you know, and obviously you can see his you know, crushing of, of Hong Kong because um, it was getting too democratic, you know, too, too vocal in their opposition to him. Um, the horrible things he's been doing in Xinjiang to the Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims. So you know, we've had a few you know, quite vivid examples of what can go wrong. Now, until quite recently, autocrats had enough confidence in their ability to manipulate elections that they would allow them to go forward in a kind of managed form. You know, Xi Jinping didn't even bother with that. But if you look at you know, most autocrats, you know, whether it's Putin or Lukashenko in Belarus or Erdogan in Turkey or Orban in, in, in Hungary, you know, they all were sort of pursuing this managed election strategy. And the idea is pretty straightforward. You know, you tilt the playing field enough by just you know, censoring enough of the media or restricting enough of the opposition political parties or constraining enough civil society that you're pretty sure you're going to win. You know, and you can allow a, an electoral event to go forward. Now, what's happened over the last few years is that you know, as people have seen through this um, you know, self-perpetrated defense of autocracy, um, and they have recognized that autocracy is not serving them, that they actually want democracy. We've had huge outpourings of, of support, you know, of, of pro-democracy demonstrations. And, you know, this was, you know, true in, in, in Hong Kong and in, in Myanmar. I mean, you know, Russia, Belarus had it. Um, you know, Iran, Sri Lanka, Uganda, Sudan, Cuba, Nicaragua. I mean, those are all just like the last two, three years. And so, 
you know, suddenly if you're an autocrat, you look out and say, you know, this is a hostile environment out there. You know, people don't really want what I'm offering. They see through my justifications. I'm not sure I can risk a managed election. And so what we're seeing instead is the emergence of zombie elections. So they still, you know, will hold an electoral event, but it's a complete sham. It's not just a tilted playing field. I mean, there's no playing field. You know, so all the opposition leaders are swept into prison. You know, the media is shut down. Uh, you know, sometimes, say, Museveni in Uganda, they shoot at opposition rallies. You know, it, it, it's, it's not even a pretense of a fair election. And so, you know, in these circumstances, the autocrats can win. You know, it's, I mean, the, the result is preordained. But there's no legitimacy that this charade confers. And so, you know, they can sometimes stay in power. I mean, we've had examples where they're ousted. Sri Lanka, they got rid of Rajapaksa. Um, you know, sometimes within an electoral contest, we see, you know, the Bolsonaros or Trumps of the world deposed. But a lot of these, you know, brutal autocrats stay in power. But they do it simply through brutality. They've lost any pretense of legitimacy, any pretense of, of being there with the consent of the people. And, and that you know, is not a long-term strategy. Because you know, even dictators need a significant degree of popular acquiescence. They need to portray themselves as serving the people. And suddenly, these autocrats are having a hard time doing that. So you know, they're getting more brutal. Um, but I think they're, you know, they're getting worried. Now, what's interesting is to watch how some of the leading autocrats are responding to that. Um, I mean, in, in the case of Putin, who's you know, never been the most sophisticated when it comes to these sorts of things, um, he's been pursuing kind of two basic strategies, um, both pretty nihilistic. Um, because you know, as he tries to really silence any dissent in Russia, as he basically rips up the Geneva Conventions and international humanitarian law in Ukraine, you know, much as he did previously in Syria and Chechnya, um, you know, what's he going to say? He doesn't have a defense. So he does two things. One is he tries to um, question whether there even are facts. You know, and it makes sort of the Trump-style alternative facts seem you know, tame. Um, they, if you ever you know, look at sort of the Kremlin spokespeople, they just you know, utterly deny reality. Like, you know, what was Bucha? Oh, Bucha was the Ukrainians killing themselves to make it look like the Russians did it. You know, I mean, it's just like this, this preposterous stuff. But if you want to kind of sympathize with the Kremlin, if, you, you know, if your foremost value is anti-imperialism, and so whoever is kind of against the United States, you're for, and there are people like that, um, this gives you a pretense to hang on. You know, and so, um, but this attack on the facts is dangerous from the perspective of human rights enforcement because we need facts. You know, that that's the main tool we have, the ability to shame governments by you know, spotlighting the discrepancy between their, their claims to respect human rights and the, the often more ugly reality. Um, we use facts for that purpose. If facts are suddenly all in question, our ability to enforce human rights is, is impeded. So that's you know, one element of Putin's strategy. The other is really you know, kind of whataboutism on steroids. Um, and if you ever you know, watch RT, you know, not that I recommend doing that, but um, you know, just like it, it's sort of you know, one Western disaster after another. You know, and it can be, it doesn't have to be you know, Western human rights violations. It could be you know, a big car crash. It could be you know, an earthquake. I mean, whatever. You know? and, and the idea is basically bad things happen everywhere, so don't pick on me. You know, yeah, there are problems in Russia, but there are problems everywhere, so just leave me alone. You know, and, and it's just this effort to kind of turn the tables to sort of shine the spotlight someplace else. So that's, you know, that's been Putin's strategy. It has not been very effective. You know, and so if you look at the response to the Ukrainian invasion, you know, the UN General Assembly, I mean, obviously the Security Council is out of the picture because of the veto. The UN General Assembly has you know, twice condemned you know, initially the invasion, secondarily the annexation of, of the four eastern Ukrainian provinces. Um, they, suspended Russia's membership in the UN Human Rights Council. The UN Human Rights Council, in turn, um, set up not only a commission of inquiry for Ukraine, but also a special rapporteur for domestic repression in Russia. 
um, the first time that that had ever happened for one of the permanent five members of the Security Council. Um, he's now you know, very likely going to face charges by the International Criminal Court, which has had 40 investigators inside Ukraine. So you know, Putin is in trouble in terms of kind of global reaction to him. And this is not even mentioning the, mentioning the military response. China is, um, is a different story. Um, and it's worth kind of dwelling on this for a moment because you know, the, Xi Jinping's you know, basic argument has been um, the Chinese people have voluntarily given up their political rights in return for getting richer. And I, Xi Jinping, am going to expand the economy. And you know, we've made great progress over these years. You know, we're not going to talk about where we're starting from, because that's the Cultural Revolution. But you know, more recently, it's, you know, things have gotten a lot better. Um, poverty has been hugely alleviated. And therefore, the Chinese people don't need their political rights. They're happy with this trade-off. Now, you know, this is where Hong Kong entered the picture, because you know, suddenly, the one part of China where people had any freedom to opine on the supposed voluntary trade-off of rights for economic growth. Um, they came out in the streets by the hundreds of thousands and said, we want nothing to do with the Chinese Communist Party dictatorship, which is frankly why Hong Kong got shut down, You know why the, the one country, two system accord was ripped up. Um, it also, you know, just an aside, this is partly why I'm worried about Taiwan, because you could say the exact same thing about Taiwan. You know, and so it's not just a matter of kind of reuniting all of China, but um, you know, th this ideological challenge that Taiwan will always pose to Beijing because of its, you know, its ability to articulate what people within China cannot articulate. So what does, you know, what does Xi Jinping do to, with that? Um, he you know, ha is absolutely determined to undermine the global human rights system because he sees the global human rights system as an existential threat. And I say this because you know, if you say, hey, President Xi, you know, why are you president of China? You know, he can't say, well, the people of China freely elected me in a fair election. You know, he, all I can say is, you know, well, the Chinese Communist Party is you know, the guiding light, and we're making people richer. Um, so he depends very significantly on international reaction to him. Because if he can show that other people treat me as the legitimate leader of China, you know, other people treat me respectfully, so should the people of China. You know? and, and so that kind of international acceptance is very important. But the flip side of that, the corollary, is that if he gets condemned by the international community, that deprives him of international legitimacy that he desperately needs to maintain his domestic legitimacy. So this is a really important issue for him, which is why we are up against the Chinese government you know, head to head in so many different fora. Because it's not just they're trying to prevent criticism of, of China anymore. I mean, it used to be you could predict China's vote at the UN Security Council by whether there was a Taiwan angle to it or the repression involved looked too much like Tibet. You know, and if, if it didn't, you know, if, if it was, say, just a classic you know, war with war crimes um, and there was no Taiwan angle, you know, nobody in there had kind of had maintained relations with Taiwan, they would let peacekeeping go through. They would let tribunals go through. No more. You know, China, along with Russia, now is basically blocking any human rights initiative. At the Human Rights Council, they vote no on everything. You know? So they are, when it comes to the possibility of their being criticized, they are, you know, they have this huge economy, and they're perfectly willing to use it as a bludgeon to prevent people from, from criticizing them. And you know, everybody knows about, say, Australia, which is the most recent example, where the Australian government you know, had the audacity to recommend an independent investigation into the origins of COVID-19 in Wuhan. The Chinese government does not want that inquiry. You know, I think mainly because they don't want people looking at the, at the Wuhan lab, where it may well have escaped from. So, um, they you know, threw the book at, at Australia and raised tariffs on all these very important Australian exports. And that was the case for you know, a couple of years. So about three years ago, uh, my colleagues and I at Human Rights Watch began approaching governments and saying, look, we know you don't want to criticize China by yourself. You know, you're too worried about retaliation. Why don't you band together? And if a group of you criticizes China, they can't retaliate against all of you. <laughs> 
You know, there's safety in numbers. And so people actually bought that. And the first time, which was, I guess, October 2019, we got 23 governments to sign on to a statement condemning the repression in Xinjiang. Um, now, we did this in Geneva, um, kind of on the outskirts of the, the UN Human Rights Council. And the tradition is that when you have a joint statement like that, somebody goes before the council and reads it out loud. And to give you a sense of the fear, nobody would read it out loud. <laughs> you know, and we, we argued and cajoled, and then finally the British government came forward, and they were willing to read it. Now, we've gone from that, fast forward three years, to October 2020, 2022, and um, we had 50 governments sign on. So the numbers are increasing. Um, we also you know, threw the dice and decided we were going to try to um, introduce a formal debate at the Human Rights Council on Xinjiang, something that had never happened. There's never been a formal debate on China ever at the Human Rights Council you know, other than the universal periodic review that everybody goes through. Um, they did not want this to happen. I mean, Xi Jinping actually was picking up the phone and calling leaders, pressing them to vote no. You know, he was calling in every chit he could from the, the Belt and Road Initiative, you know, this $1 trillion ostensible infrastructure development program, which is really an effort to buy off elites of various countries so they vote with China at the UN. You know, so through enormous coercion, China was be able to beat us by two votes. It was really close. You know, and they are not happy with that result because we're going to try again. And the momentum is on our side. And it's worth noting that this vote, it came you know, after Michelle Bachelet's strong, if belated, report on Xinjiang. So if you read the report, the report is great. If you just ignore the date, which was you know, a year later than it should have come out, and 13 minutes before the end of her term. So she kind of published and ran. And Volker Turk came in, you know, Volker Turk being very much Antonio Guterres's choice. And Volker Turk, to this day, has refused to say a critical word about China, even though, in my view, China and the Chinese government is the most serious threat to the global human rights movement there is today, you know, because of the combination of its, its intentionality, its desire to undermine that system, and the means, the economic means, to, to back that. Um, he you know, pretends to care. He says, I'm going to go have a dialogue with the Chinese government. You know, I mean, this is such BS. You know, the idea that this guy, you know, just imagine this conversation. Uh, President Xi, would you please treat the Uyghurs more nicely? You know, and, and she says, why don't we discuss that for the next five years in the sub-basement of the foreign ministry? But of course, purely confidentially, if anything gets out, we're going to cut off the dialogue. I mean, that's how the Chinese government responds to these things. So Volker Turk is like completely playing Beijing's game. Um, by not using the only tool he has, which is the ability to speak out and publicly shame Beijing. And he's doing this because you know, clearly he's under orders from Guterres, who's adopted the exact same approach. So you know, we have made the progress that we have made without the help of the UN Secretary General, without the help of the current UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, but we are still kind of moving in the right direction as people see through the um, you know, the, the, the dangers posed by the Chinese government to the human rights movement. So you know, all of that adds up to you know, a pretty hostile environment if you are an autocrat. And you know, Erdogan is coming up for re-election. I mean, who knows how this earthquake's going to cut in that. I think probably against him. But it's just it's too early to say. But he is um, you know, he's trying to disqualify his principal opponent, the, the mayor of, um, of Istanbul. Um, you see you know, these things playing out, but I think most of, most of these autocrats are really running scared right now. And so you know, on this global contest, this you know, common wisdom that autocracy is in the ascendancy, that's just not my experience. And I don't think it's the reality out there. But I don't want to conclude on that point because I don't want us to get super complacent. Um, because in fact, we do have a problem with democracy. And I think we have to recognize that and try to address it. Um, in order to really prevail over the long term um, in, in promoting democracy. 
And the problem is that you know, democratic government is not serving significant sectors of our societies. And you know, it's the people who feel left behind. And there, um, there's a certain uniformity to who these people are if you kind of look around the world. I mean, they tend to be members of the ethnic majority of the country. They tend to be rural. They tend to be less educated. They're not benefiting from the global economy. They certainly are not benefiting from tech. You know, they're, um, they're not starving. You know, so they're not, um, they're not necessarily voting their economic interests. They're voting their cultural interests. But they feel disrespected and unheard. And they are ripe for populist figures within democracies to exploit their discontent using an anti-rights message. And by that I mean by choosing an unpopular minority, demonizing them in a way that this you know, portion of the ethnic majority finds attractive, and pushing this illiberal approach with considerable success. You know, that is what Trump did, you know, focusing you know, mainly on, on, on immigrants, but also on, on blacks, on, on trans people. You know, it's what um, you know, the, the Polish government does with you know, immigrants who are not Ukrainian, um, with, with women's rights around reproductive freedom, around LGBT people. They created these LGBT-free zones in rural villages. You know, it's what Orban does with his, um, you know, again, anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant rhetoric, and also anti-Semitic, um, you know, attacking Soros for everything. So um, there's a certain commonality to this populist exploitation of this genuine discontent. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, those of us who are sitting here kind of coastal elites, um, we, I think, do tend to look down on these people. You know, and say, oh, they're just conservative, and, and you know, they're benighted, and what do they know? You know, and there is a sort of a tendency to kind of just pass them off as indoctrinated by Fox News if you're in this country or their equivalent in some other country, and not take their concerns seriously. And I don't mean you know, endorsing their dislike of multicultural societies or you know, endorsing their racism or whatever you know, the illiberal aspects of their views are. But there is a side to them the side that feels disrespected, that feels you know, unaddressed by government, that feels that their stagnation is being ignored, that their diminished life prospects um, are not being improved by anybody. Those are all things that we can and should do something about. And I think that that is essential to revitalize democracy and to contest this populist attack from within. Because there is something ironic here. You know, at a moment when the world that is actually subject to autocratic rule is doing everything it can to turn its back on autocratic rule, you have people who are in established democracies who are losing faith in democracy and are willing to toy with populists who are at least adopting certain elements of the autocratic ad agenda in terms of its illiberality, its you know, undermining of checks and balances on executive authority and the like. So I. Um, you know, I, I want to conclude just by saying that you know, I think the common wisdom is wrong, but that um, we have work to do um, both to continue to fight this battle between democracy and autocracy, but also to reinforce our democracy. And we can't com be complacent about what's going on at home, or we risk you know, not only losing what we have here, but also losing the global battle. So I will stop there and welcome your, your thoughts and comments. Thank you. Uh, I hope you'll excuse me if I, uh, if I get procedural for a moment uh, and say that earlier I ought to have thanked the other co-sponsors uh, of this event, uh, the HLS Advocates for Human Rights, International Human Rights Clinic, Harvard Human Rights Journal, Program on Law and Society in the Muslim World, Program on International Law and Armed Conflict, Program in Islamic Law, and East Asian Legal Studies. Uh, I think I'm going to pick up on the phrase East Asian Legal Studies for a moment uh, and say part of the story, as you've told it, uh, is about the activities that are being done to 
deal with the major autocratic uh, societies, uh, and maybe uh, I can add to that uh, electoral authoritarian societies, uh, if we want to include Russia uh, in that category. Uh, but there's also struggle going on in lesser uh, countries uh, between attempts at democratic reform uh, in, in opposition, as you were giving some examples, uh, to, uh, to the authoritarians, uh, or the opposite, the slide uh, into authoritarianism. Uh, and can I ask uh, if you could speak a bit about what you think that uh, human rights NGOs or the human rights system uh, generally uh, can do to assist in those local contests? Uh, because of the, you know, the global contest, in, in part, it's the question of what, what the sum of all the local no, contest absolutely. is going to be. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I just I can't get it all in the lack of time. But um, you're absolutely right, Jerry, that you, know, you have to fight these battles one country at a time. So I mean, just to give an example, so maybe somewhat close to home, you know, in Europe, the two big populist threats are coming from the Polish and the Hungarian governments. And um, this has been a you know, huge priority for Human Rights Watch. What we have done is, um, you know, apart from reporting on what's happening, um, it's not in, enough in these cases to just you know, spotlight it. Because in fact, the illiber illiberality is, you know, is popular among the base of Orban or, or the Peace Party. In, in, um... But we've been trying to use the leverage provided by Brussels and the European Union. Because Poland is the largest recipient of European Union subsidies. Um, Hungary is the largest per capita recipient, I think the second overall. And we um, pushed for conditionality to be imposed on those subsidies. Um, and it was a huge battle. Um, it took, and we tried to persuade Angela Merkel. Um, her last few months as chancellor corresponded with Germany having the presidency of the European Union. And it was during that period that um, the, seven, the, the current seven-year budget for the European Union was pushed through. Um, she was very reluctant to impose conditionality for fear of what Orban would do to German businesses that use Hungary as a sort of a cheap um, you know, back office for, for assembly plants. Um, so she did it in a way that kind of kicked the problem off to the European Court of Justice. But now the European Court of Justice has, has confirmed that indeed this conditionality is, is appropriate. And so they, the term they use is rule of law. Um, but rule of law conditionality has now been imposed. And in fact, um, there has been some significant withholding of billions of euros from those two countries. Now, it's complicated because of Ukraine. You know, Poland has now taken in millions of Ukrainian refugees. And nobody really wants to kind of you know, beat them up too much because of that. You know, Orban is using the fact that the European Union operates by consensus on external policy issues, meaning anybody can veto, meaning that Orban can say, you know, we're not going to do X for the Ukrainians, or we're not going to impose Y sanction on the Russians unless you keep my subsidies coming. So that's the battle that we're in, in the middle of. But nonetheless, lots of money has been withheld. And there is serious pressure put on both of those governments now um, to liberalize. It's, it's a work in progress. It's not done. But that's been the, the main thing that we're doing. Thank you. And then can I ask, uh, in, this, in the struggle uh, in the more democratic states between uh, democracy and insurgent authoritarian populism, uh, you talked about the kinds of governance that the states need to engage in and the way they need to address uh, the un unmet uh, needs of the portions of the population who are, who are feeling neglected. And I'm just wondering, does the human rights framework provide an important set of uh, guidelines and plans for doing this? Or are we really talking about something which needs to be done on somewhat different terms uh, 
uh, than the terms that an orthodox human rights analysis uh, would lead us to do. Yeah, Jerry, I think it's more the latter. You know, there's, I mean, if you take an economic rights analysis and say, you know, is the government using available resources to progressively realize, in a sense, the most, to meet the most basic needs of people, these left behind people um, have their basic needs met for the most part. You know, there may be, you know, in this country, say, the problems of the opioid crisis, you know, problems of joblessness, but um, it, it's not like there's a lack of governmental programs for the most part. I think what's more missing is, um, you know, one, a sense of respect. I mean, that's, I think, in many ways, the most important thing, which, you know, Trump, for all his faults, was quite good at providing that respect because he um, had the same disillusionment with the coastal elites as these left behind people. You know, Trump had always, you know, he was kind of always the, the, the crass guy from Queens who was never accepted in Manhattan and genuinely resented these people and could share that resentment with these people, you know, with, with his constituents in a way that was quite honest and genuine, even though he was a gazillionaire. You know, so that was, you know, but finding ways to convey that respect to say, you know, we, we don't just, you know, look down on you. We recognize that you're citizens and, and you've got to be made part of the society. That's a political thing. You know, as is figuring out, you know, are there governmental programs that can be pursued? Probably not as a matter of basic rights, but just, you know, things that bring people into the, into the national economy, that, that give them more of a future. And these are, I think that's what we need to look at. So, I mean, yes, a humanized perspective is useful to identify, you know, what are the, the real basic needs that are not being met. But I think most of what we're talking about is a notch above that. And human rights don't have to be the answer to everything. You know, I, I think it's not, it, it's, not a, you know, it's not the only moral framework to use. It's an important one, but not the only one. And for the record, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now I'd like to open it up to the floor. Human rights professors don't have to be the only people who can ask questions. Uh, question in the back. Uh, there's a microphone coming so that you can be heard. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering what your like take or approaches on the situation with the dictatorship in Venezuela, because it seems like that's a situation where there's very low support for the regime, a huge like humanitarian economic social crisis. Um, under all like indicators or factors, that seems like there would be a place for a transition that doesn't seem to be occurring at all. So what? I, I don't know. Just what, what's yeah. your approach or your perspective? No, it's. I mean. Venezuela is a very difficult situation for precisely the reasons you outlined. I mean, it's, it's a humanitarian disaster. There are as many Venezuelan refugees as there are Syrian refugees, to put this in perspective. You know? So um, you know, a very large percent of, of the country is outside because of just utterly disastrous economic circumstances and no prospect of improvement. And Maduro has been very successful in, um, you know, in a sense, keeping the military happy, but also surveilling the military enough using largely Cubans to avoid any kind of insurgency or, or coup. And so he's been willing to destroy the country in order to maintain his power um, and you know, literally destroy the country if you consider the people the essence of the country. So, um, and what makes it, even though there are sanctions imposed, obviously his, his ability to raise revenue by oil sales has been radically diminished. There is the problem of you don't want to starve the Venezuelan people. So, you know, how do you allow humanitarian aid in without benefiting Maduro? It's very similar to what, you know, the question that arises in Afghanistan right now. Um, the, what worries me currently is that, you know, just as Biden went to the Saudi crown prince, you know, to beg him to pump, pump a little more oil to, you know, help avoid, you know, help compensate for the Russian shortfalls and fight inflation, so the US is now looking for ways to allow oil to be pumped again and sold by Venezuela, um, viewing that as more important than what's happening to the Venezuelan people. And this is you know, part of a broader um, you know, difficulty with Biden's foreign policy. Because you know, Biden very much recognizes the threat posed by Russia and China, but he's not pursuing those human rights violations through a, a strategy of principled support for human rights. He's weaponizing human rights. And he's very willing to attack you know, where they get it wrong. But he's just trying to build alliances everyplace else, regardless of who the ally is. 
and it has you know Cold War echoes to it. So um, you know my fear is that we're kind of the West and principally the U.S. in the case of Venezuela is moving toward an accommodation with Maduro. Now there have been negotiations with him about you know would he allow a more genuine election next time around. You know there is some movement in that direction. There, the big question is whether. Um, the opposition can rally around a single candidate, or whether they're just going to shoot themselves in the foot by having too many candidates. You know, the one Guaido had had been the candidate, but is no longer. You know, he's kind of had his day, and they've moved on. So they got to find somebody else. And um, so these are the big questions. You know, it's it's not impossible that you would have a modestly fair contest, which an organized opposition united around a single candidate wins. But a lot of things have to go right for that to happen. Wait, hang on for a second. I had a question about Taiwan specifically yeah. and the sort of relationship that the U.S. is entering with China where it seems to resemble a sort of new Cold War almost, especially considering the microchip industry. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see that playing out? Do you think Taiwan is going to face a similar future to Ukraine in the sense that China will attempt to annex it, or do you think the U.S. can successfully ward off those interests? Well, I mean, actually, you're asking me now a military question as opposed to a humanized question, which I have not that much expertise on. So, um, you know, I mean, clearly there is a you know an actively ramped up effort to defend Taiwan. You know, most recently this this new deal with the Philippines to station U.S. troops there in larger numbers is you know it's, it's a big deal. Um, I do suspect that Xi Jinping is looking at how successful the Ukrainians have been in fending off Russia, even though there's a shared land border there. You know, it's it's you don't have to sail people across the sea to get there. And you know, if the Ukrainians could do that, could the Taiwanese do that? Um, on the other hand, the Ukrainians had eight years to prepare for this. You know, since 2014, they've been fighting the Russians, but just on a smaller scale. So by the time the the big invasion came a year ago, they had a lot of experience. The Taiwanese have no experience, you know, and so it's just it's hard to know. I mean, I I'm a little worried about the the tail wagging the dog phenomenon because you know if the Chinese economy begins to go south, which it may be doing right now for some of the reasons I, I noted, um, you know, not to mention just the demographic problems that they're having and the like, um, the trade wars, um, and suddenly Xi Jinping can't even deliver on his side of his self-imposed deal um, by making people richer. That's when leaders try to change the subject with the war. You know, and there's nothing like any kind of a nationalist flag-waving war to get people to forget about their economic problems. So, you know, that, that's a risk. Where does this all add, add up to? I don't know. You know, and I can guess as well as you can. Thank you. Uh, you talked about countering large players like Russia and China at the UN and the world stage, and then also the threat within the U EU where you have that framework. I'm wondering what the strategy of Human Rights Watch is when you have smaller pariah states like Myanmar or Afghanistan or Iran or Sri Lanka, where it's not an issue top of US foreign policy, and you don't have a structure like the EU or mm. even really the UN. Uh, what, what is your strategy to sort of find yeah. footholds there? Yeah, I mean, you know, each one is different. Take Myanmar, for example, which, you know, what are we now, I guess, two years into this, you know? Um, so, for better or worse, there's very significant deference to ASEAN. And, you know, ASEAN has some big problems. You know, it, one half of their members are themselves pretty autocratic. You know, Thailand came, you know, the, there was a military junta there too until they tried to cleanse themselves with an election. You know, so, so and they, they operate by consensus. So ASEAN as, a, as ASEAN has been stymied. And they got this you know, five point plan where the Myanmar junta agreed, you know, among other things, to stop the violence and to release the political prisoners. And that clearly hasn't happened. But so now what? You know, and, and if the answer to that is that ASEAN has to act as ASEAN, nothing's going to happen. 
So, I mean, our strategy has been to try to deprive the junta of the economic means to finance its repression and have been quite successful in cutting off a number of revenue streams, the principal one being um, gas. The, but some of the big ASEAN members could still be very influential. And we've been looking you know, principally at Singapore, which is still kind of the banking center there. A lot of the junta, the generals kind of keep their money there. Um, you know, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, all are kind of allies in this in a way that, you know, Cambodia or Vietnam or Thailand are not, um, Brunei, you know. So, um, so we've been trying to push you know, a bilateral strategy, but the aim has really been to cut off the revenue, to just make it harder and harder for them to sustain themselves. Um, you know, China is an actor in this, but China, um, you know, even if you go back to the, the, the democratic transition, I mean, China was very detested at that stage for backing the junta prior one. And, and a lot of why um, the generals then allowed the democratic opening and Aung San Suu Kyi to emerge was um, because they were isolated even by China. Um, and ironically, they were worried about becoming a Chinese economic province too. You know, there's like, there's nobody else. Um, so, but China is now treading cautiously. So I think it's doable to keep squeezing the generals, but that's, you know, that's the aim, is to kind of go after one more source of revenue after another. And you know, so there, I mean, there's strategies like this for, for everything. You know, and it just, it, it varies. But you know, what we do is, obviously our, our, our bread and butter is to document what's going on and to publicize it. But you then do have to figure out, well, what does the government want? And how do we prevent them from getting it until they change? And a lot of that's economics. And so we have to you know, see you know, who are the potential allies with the most influence whom we can get to and get to back us. And that's a lot of what we do. You know, so there's this kind of research side where we have like investigators around the world investigating the stuff and reporting. But then we have advocates who are based in key capitals around the world who deploy the information and try to get governments to help us move the target. Do you have a question here? Hi, um, thank you for being here. This is quite a similar question to the one recently asked, but there's a political scientist called Paul Post who has some data that shows that countries that have autocratized in the last five years actually join international organizations at relatively high rates, focusing sort of on technical international organizations. So I'm wondering, given the strategy that you just mentioned, are you supportive of sort of newer autocracies that might be more unstable, actually expanding international op cooperation in order to maybe have more influence from a human rights perspective? Or would you focus on, like you sort of mentioned, squeezing them and sort of limiting their resources? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm not familiar with the paper you cite, but it wouldn't surprise me that, you know, if you have a, a new autocratic government, they're looking for legitimacy. One easy way to do it is to join some UN body. You know, and so, so do they really care about you know, telecommunications or whatever the issue is? Probably not. But they want to say that they're a member. You know, so that's the incentive there. Um, Human Rights Watch doesn't oppose those sorts of memberships and ordinary organizations. We, we never try to you know, expel governments from this or that, with the exception of the Human Rights Council. And you know, now they sometimes try to get on the Human Rights Council too, but for the wrong reason. You know, why is Eritrea on the Human Rights Council? You know, it's just to try to undermine its work. You know? so, um, but we will oppose that. Otherwise, we don't, we're, we're neutral on whether they join. I um, doubt that it liberalizes them. I think they probably join for the opposite reasons, um, to try to legitimize themselves. But it's just not, that's not a battle we've taken on. Thank you. Over here? Um, so going back to the question about the contest between democracy and aut autocracy mm -hmm. globally, um, I was wondering on, in relation to the latter part about developments within kind of Western democracies and the rise of um, that populist figure, um, looking, looking beyond perceptions or shifts occurring domestically, one may also point to um, a kind of um, retreat in the 
condemnation of autocrats globally from the perspective of a Western audience. And I'll just give a basic example. I was re watching a relatively mainstream um, outlet and they were pointing to certain um, countries in the Gulf um, and saying, sure, they're autocrats, but look at their crime rates and look at how great or, you know, a number of things are going. And it seemed to be having that type of receptive audience. And I think... Um, other examples as well, perhaps Putin, Trump, and <laughs> that era. But I think um, if I'm going to ask this question, to what extent, um, what 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 kind of role does human rights discourse have in kind of uh, changing um, the perceptions of autocracies globally, and to bring it back to that place where, if we mention autocracy, it's automatically understood to be a kind of negative thing, um, if there is a shift at all. Yeah. No, you know, you're pointing to a real phenomenon, which is um, a real selectivity on the part of a number of Western governments in terms of which autocrats they would, you know, oppose because of their repression and which not. And, you know, the part of the world where it's really a, a kind of a human rights black hole when it comes to Western promotion is the Middle East, you know. And, um, you know, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt, and there's not even to mention Israel. I mean, they're just, um, nobody promotes human rights there these days. And it's because Western governments have other greater interests at the moment. So it's stopping migration, it's fighting terrorism, it's, you know, pumping gas, it's, you know, defending Israel, it's fighting Iran. Um, all of this militates against promoting human rights. And I think... Um, I think one big factor in all of this, going back to the, the Egyptian experience, you know, and Obama sort of supporting the, the transition away from Mubarak, um, Morsi won you know, a reasonably fair election at that stage. The US and the European governments have kind of bought this view that the Muslim Brotherhood government that Morsi led in Egypt was really just Islamist terrorism. It wasn't. You know, but this is the Gulf view. And, and why do they say that? Because, you know, the Gulf monarchies, um, particularly the Saudis, portray themselves as political Islam. You know, we are guardians of the, the holy sites. And the idea that political Islam would have an electoral dimension is scary. So they're doing everything they can to snuff out that possibility. They basically say, you know, the only legitimate kind of political Islam is monarchical. Anything else is Islamist extremism. There is no middle ground. And the Muslim Brotherhood, by definition, Islamist extremism. Now, that is um, convenient but completely short-sighted because you know, there are many people who believe deeply in Islam, would like to have their, their votes informed by Islamist views, but who are not terrorists, who are not you know, extremists. They, you know, they're kind of the Egyptian equivalent of the Christian Democrats in Germany. And um, we're closing off that option. And so you know, most people just grin and bear it and live with a brutal dictator like Sisi. But you know, some people are actually going to be driven to extremism because they're not allowed the moderate choice. So it's very short-sighted. It's very informed by the Saudis and the Emiratis in particular. But this view is, is you know, conveniently guiding a lot of the Western response as well. So it's a partial answer to your much broader question. Thank you. Is it back row? Yeah. Me? Yeah. Hello, Rod. Hi. Thank you so much uh, for coming and speaking. Um, I, my question has to deal with speaking truth to power. Um, you've, we've seen how the backlash has come with you speaking about Israel. Um, and as someone who came to law school to do that same thing when it came to police brutality and other issues happening domestically, um, um, I'm, I am encouraged and um, I'm, thank you. I just want to say thank you for that. Um, um, so my question has to deal with, with um, I've been to Israel twice. Mm -hmm. And I like to think that like, when I talk about police brutality, when I talk about the issues happening domestically, I'm a, I, I'm, I am very confident with talking about it and writing op-eds or doing what I need to do to talk about it. Uh, many of us who went on the trip to Israel through ITREK, who are of black or African-American descent, um, went there looking to 
talk about the Israel-Palestinian issue um, that you discussed. Um, and many of us were shocked to see how people of African descent within Israel were treated like second-class citizens. Mm -hmm. and, um, and many of us who are all just as open about talking about what's happening here domestically um, fear about what, whether we talk about that experience, we could be deemed anti-Semitic or, um, or seen made the same backlash that you have, have seen. But many of us don't have that same platform as you. So I was wondering um, on, that, on that end, um, what, is, what keeps you going in terms and what gives you the, the courage to keep discussing these issues? And what do you think moving forward, how more people can, um, can have the courage to discuss that like you have? Thank you. Well, look, I mean, I've been doing this for a while. Um, and, you know, I gain confidence over time. You know, when I, when I take on a tough issue, I get lambasted, and I survive, it allows me to do it again. You know, and, and I, so, I mean, particularly on Israel-Palestine, where I've been, like, beaten up for years, just get used to it. You know, it's like life goes on. And so I, it's not, you know, it's not that hard for me to do. It's just, but I recognize I'm in a very privileged position um, because I've had an organization behind me and, and, you know, I've been able to survive it. It is, um, it is hard. And I think it's, you know, one, it's important to speak out. Two, it's important to take on the efforts to silence you. And I think the best way to fight the censorship is to name the censorship. And so, I mean, if you take, for example, you, the charge of anti-Semitism, which, you know, I get people throw it at me all the time. I mean, it's crazy. You know, I'm 100% I'm Jewish. Um, my father fled the Nazis. You know, I grew up with Hitler stories. That's why I went into this thing. I'm supposed to be anti-Semitic because I criticize Israel. Um, you know, I can just slough this off because it's kind of a joke. But a lot of people are, are worried about that. You know, they don't want to be called anti-Semitic. And I've, you know, very deliberately now started to talk about the misuse of that charge. And, you know, what I've been saying is that anti-Semitism is a genuine, serious, vibrant threat. Using it as a cudgel to silence criticism of Israel undermines the effort to fight anti-Semitism. Because if people think that the charge of anti-Semitism is just a censorship effort, it's not an effort to attack the real problem, you cheapen anti-Semitism. And you know, so the state of Israel may be slightly better off because you know, one or two more fewer critics, but Jewish people are probably worse off because they've you know, lost this important tool to fight anti-Semitism. And I just think it's important to take on these kind of censorship issues. And I'm, you know, I'm sure there are equivalents that come up with police brutality or anything else. But it's a way of just you know, take one step back, look at the dialogue, look at how you're trying to be censored, and talk about that. And I, I find that that's a very effective way of turning the table and actually you know, fighting back against the censorship efforts. Thank you. I think that's as great a place as any uh, to end this conversation for today. Uh, I hope we can look forward uh, in the future to more conversations uh, on this and other topics. Uh, and please join me in thanking Kenneth Roth. <laughs>